Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Graham Ferrara to the show. Graham is the president and chief cannabis officer of Glasshouse Group, one of the most rapidly growing privately held cannabis and hemp companies in the country, and the founder of Glasshouse Farms, perhaps the largest greenhouse operation in California. He was part of the original team at Software.com, taking the company public in 1999, and one of the first employees at Sonos, where he was involved with product design, development, and sales and customer support. With 25 years of experience in the technology sector, as well as in starting successful businesses in new and emerging markets, Graham has now created one of the largest earth-friendly cannabis and hemp businesses in the country, conducting precision agriculture in greenhouses with a cutting-edge water reclamation system, filtration, recycling, integrated pest management, and other industry-leading cultivation techniques. His sun-grown and ocean-grown operation is viewed as a model for tech innovation, sustainability, and financial success in the cannabis space. Graham, how are you doing today? Hey, Rod. How's it going? Excellent. Good to be here. Good to have you, Graham. Graham, where are you currently located? So I'm uh, sitting in sunny Santa Barbara, California. It's about 100 miles north of Los Angeles, uh, right on the coast. Uh, happens to be a really amazing place both to live as well as to grow cannabis, which is what... How far are you from the ocean? Um, currently, I am about a seven-minute walk. Our greenhouses are uh, a golf club drive away from the beach. In both cases, we've got two farms uh, in the southern Santa Barbara County in an area called Carpinteria. Uh, one of them is literally across uh, the street from the beach, and the other is uh, about four or five blocks back. Sounds beautiful. It's, it's, all, it's beautiful, and it's a great place. The climate here is... Uh, is truly outstanding when it comes to cannabis cultivation. Uh, the reason we are here, and I will actually say, I'm lucky enough that this is my hometown, hometown so the serendipity of getting to do what I love um, and being a cannabis cultivator in my own backyard is really amazing. Uh, but the reason that we are here is that um, many decades ago, 50, 50 60 years ago, uh, the Japanese and Dutch farmers, who are some of the best farmers on the planet, uh, scoured the United States. And they started on the East Coast and they uh, came West until they found uh, Santa Barbara and they found a sunny 330-day uh, a year of sunshine, temperate, you know, 55 to 75 degree weather, flat land, uh, water under the ground. Um, and in our case, uh, additionally, just, uh, you know, an hour and a half away from Los Angeles, which is the biggest cannabis uh, market on the planet. Amazing. So, Graham, I'd like to open the show by asking my guest the following question. If you were asked to share something interesting about yourself, what would it be? Oh, that's a, that's a great one. Um, so let's see. What's interesting about me? Uh, I've spent uh, four years living on a sailboat and have uh, you know pretty, come pretty close to uh, circumnavigating the globe. I did it in two halves and two two-year stints. Um, one right after um, we took our company, Software.com, which was one of my original tech forays, uh, public in about 1999, bought a sailboat, left with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and we sailed from Santa Barbara to New Zealand over the course of two years. And then the second time after starting uh, Sonos, which was uh, my second tech uh, adventure, um, and uh, left there and went and lived uh, on a boat with uh, my wife and my daughter at that time, who's one, and uh, friends and their uh, couple of kids. And we did uh, four years out sailing the ocean, which was uh, two of the most fun things I've ever done. What's the name of your boat? Uh, so the first boat was called Pauhana, which means uh, after work and is kind of a slang term in Hawaiian for happy hour. So Pauhana is when the work's done and you go have a Pauhana drink. Uh, and the second boat was called Keiki Kai, which is a uh, pretty botched uh, translation of uh, Children of the Sea because we had our kids with us for that trip. So you can see uh, a couple double Hawaii influences. My wife is from Hawaii. So uh, we're, we got some strong roots there. Why did you decide to go sailing? Um, that's a good question. I think, uh, so I love travel and I think, um, you know, the solution 
to a closed mind is travel. And I think that's underappreciated, particularly uh, by people maybe who live in the United States is just how important it is to get out and see other people's perspectives. And that's uh, easiest done when you're standing, if not in their shoes, at least uh, close to them. Um, a lot of the things that I like to do, kiteboarding, surfing, snorkeling, scuba diving, all revolve around uh, the ocean. And um, a lot of the places that I'm interested in going, the you know, Tahiti's and the Fiji's and uh, even, in, you know, the Mediterranean, the, uh, the you know, awesome Ibiza's and uh, Mallorca's and all those things are on the ocean. So we decided that the best way to do that was to bring our house with us. Um, and the best way to do that is on a boat. So you put all that together and uh, we traveled the world uh, with our with our with our shell on our back in the form of the boat uh, so that we could be gone for years at a time uh, and do it reasonably comfortably. So can you take a moment to walk us through that first journey from California to New, New Zealand? Sure. So um, uh, we bought a, a boat. It was a 46 foot um, center cockpit cutter rig sloop, which means it has one mast, uh, but two sails in front and that the, the where you drive from is in the middle of the boat. Um, it was built uh, by a company called Moody, which is a British company and make really strong, not particularly fast, but very strong kind of cruising boats. Um, and a, uh, a bit that will tell you a lot about my personality. It is the first boat that I've ever owned. Um, and I bought the boat and then I took a two week sailing class and then I outfitted it and then we set sail for New Zealand um, and uh, somehow survived. Much to my uh, girlfriend at the time's father's uh, chagrin, I think. Um, but after coming to visit us, he, uh, he left more confident. We sailed out of Santa Barbara Harbor. Uh, we sailed down California, all the way down to uh, Cabo San Lucas, which is the tip of Baja, uh, Baja Mexico, around that corner, up into the Sea of Cortez. We uh, weathered the, wintered there for the hurricane season and then sailed back down um, mainland Mexico to Mazatlan. We set off from Mazatlan for a trip that took us 22 days across the Pacific without seeing a single other soul um, and landed in the Marquesas, which is the far eastern side of French Polynesia. Then we went through uh, the Marquesas, which are absolutely phenomenal and highly recommended. I'd never even heard of them before this trip, but it's like the Tahiti you wish uh, you could have visited. Um, you know, nothing but crystal clear water. It looks like you're looking through thick glass. The fish are amazing. The surfing's great. The diving's are phenomenal. Nobody goes there because it's about 400 miles east of Tahiti. Um, and then we went from the Tumotus to Tahiti, uh, hung out there for a few months, uh, and then ended up kind of going Palmerston, Nui, Tonga, Fiji. Fiji also phenomenal and really amazing, welcoming people, great surfing and diving there too. Fiji for a while, and then on to New Zealand, which is where we uh, we ended that trip um, about two years later. So while I don't want to spend the whole show on this, I'm just fascinated by it, so I'm going to keep asking questions. Sure, go. Um, 22 days on the water, what do you do? Yeah, um, you do a lot of, you know, I, would, I think, think of it like a, a marathon a little bit, right? I mean, it's a slow motion marathon, but it's a marathon. Um, you're, you're sailing in shifts, you know, you never stop the boat. So, you know, you're kind of doing like a four hour shift where you're responsible uh, for the navigation and, you know, keeping the sails trimmed and making sure you don't, you know, head the wrong direction, uh, during the day. And then you do two hour shifts at night. So maybe kind of like being a, uh, a new parent, you know, you, you transition to this kind of like, a uh, uh, homogeneous, there's not days and nights and eight hour sleeps. It's, it's more just kind of an around the clock thing. Um, you have quite a bit to do, uh, just on the operation of the boat, making food, sleeping, navigating, dealing with the weather, uh, checking in on ham radio to, you know, let other people know where you're at, uh, downloading weather reports. So it's, you know, very kind of operational um, and continuous. Uh, monotonous isn't the right word. Um, you know, I think one saying of uh, sailing is it's, a, it's, it's, it's hours of boredom, boredom interrupted by moments of sheer terror. And that can, uh, that can be fairly accurate. <laughs> As a, when everything's going great, you're kind of just sitting there drifting along on the way to Tahiti with thousands of miles to go if things go wrong. Uh, it can be pretty intense. Um, so, you know, card playing, we watched some movies. Um, we slept when we could, uh, took up a good bit of the time. So, you know, the time actually goes, uh, like I said, you know, it's almost maybe like being in, in quarantine these days, right? It's like all of a sudden, you know, it, has it been one day or five days? I don't know. Is it, it's, you know, the, the 97th of March sometimes it feels like uh, back in those quarantine days. So the, the sailing trip across the ocean was kind of like that. It's amazing. I'm always fascinated by the, the sailors of old, you know, who navigated the oceans, let's call it hundreds of years ago, without any of the modern day tools. Going back to your trip for a moment, um, are you required to file a 
So in, in flying airplanes, you have to file a flight plan. Are you required to file a plan so people know where you are, or is it all just off your communications? Yeah, there is absolutely nothing. So I'm actually a pilot too, and, and you do have to file a flight plan if you're flying an uh, instrument. But if you just want to take off as a VFR pilot and GA, you actually don't have to file anything with anybody there either. There's no requirement to uh, necessarily talk to anybody unless you enter in the airspace uh, where that requirement exists. Very much like that uh, with sailing, there is there is not even there, no requirement. There is no one to file it with. There is nobody that is the tra- air traffic control of boating. So um, if you want people to know where you are, you actually have to do some work to even have somebody that would pay attention to where you're at on a even daily basis. And you mentioned the kite surfing and the windsurfing. Did you see the video last week of the two ladies in the humpback whale? I did not see that. Someone told me about it, but I have not pulled it up myself. It sounds it sounds amazing. Kite kiteboarding one of one of my favorite sports out there. The you know it's a combination of snowboarding, surfing, and sailing all together, uh, and you get to use you know, Mother Nature as your engine um, and have an immense amount of power on tap. And it is so fun, especially in those tropical locations like the Tuamotus. They're all atolls, which means that it's basically the middle of the island is collapsed. So what you have is a ring island with usually a small channel into the middle. And you get the, the circumstance there where the water is completely protected. So it's like, you know, sometimes mirror, mirror flat water, but the islands are only, you know, six, seven feet tall in some cases because they're just as the beach basically. And so the wind rips across these things that trade wind, you know, 22 knots, but yet the water is undisturbed. And when you put those uh, ingredients together, it's some of the best kite surfing in the world. Well, it sounds fascinating, and I promise I'm going to switch here in a minute. But one last question. If you could sail anywhere in the world, where would you go? That's a good question. Um, so I'd say the two motus are a pretty great spot. Um, I did not do anything. We did not hit the like uh, the kind of Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, e kind of uh, part of the world. That was one, one gap that we had. So I'd love to go check check out those zones. Um, but you know, of, of places I've been, I would say, uh, the BVIs are awesome. It's almost like a, um, you know, Disneyland for sailing, uh, <laughs> Edie, uh, is great, but I'd pick Fiji over it. And the two, mo- two Motus were kind of the surprise star of the show for our trip. We, you know, I think we thought we were just kind of sailing through them on our way to Tahiti turned out to be some of uh, the favorite part of the entire South Pacific for us. I appreciate you sharing that. So going back to cannabis, can you give the audience an overview of Glasshouse Farms and your role at the organization? Yeah, sure. And also a, a thank you. I, I think uh, we uh, we are your first cannabis uh, guest. So, uh, you know, I always love busting down a, uh, a new door and, uh, and thanks for being there to, to open it. <laughs> so I appreciate sure. that. Um, yeah, so Glasshouse Farms uh, or Glasshouse Group, which is our kind of combined company, um, is one of the largest uh, cannabis companies in California. Um, in our asset mix, uh, started with cultivation, started in about uh, 2015. So, you know, coming up on uh, over a half a decade here, which is you know not necessarily that long, but in cannabis uh, makes us one of the older kids in the candy store, uh, so to speak. There's not a lot of folks that have been doing um, you know, things at scale like we have for that long. Uh, we have two farms. Um, it's about a half million square feet total. Um, uh, that's about 13 acres, um, all in greenhouse. We really like greenhouses because uh, for reasons I think we'll dig into, but we like it. It allows us to you know, partner with Mother Nature and kind of control, you know, tame her just enough to create a really perfect climate. Um, so we have a half million square feet of cultivation. Uh, we have 22,000 square feet of manufacturing where we do extraction uh, work on uh, on cannabis as well to make other products like vapes and tinctures and balms and edibles and things like that. We have four retail stores, uh, the Pharmacy Santa Barbara, which was the first ever um, adult use dispensary in the city of Santa Barbara that I opened uh, about two years ago. The Pharmacy Berkeley, which is our most recent store, opened in February of this year. The Pottery, which is down in Los Angeles, and Bud and Bloom, which is in Santa Ana. And then we have four, br- four brands, uh, Glasshouse Farms, which is uh, predominantly a flower brand, Field Extracts, which is a connoisseur premium high-end extract brand, uh, Forbidden Flowers, which is a brand that we created with uh, Bella Thorne, who's an actress, and Mama Sue, which is a health and wellness brand uh, created in partnership with Sue Taylor, who's a 70-year-old African-American woman, and it's targeted on seniors and kind of how they can find relief uh, with cannabis as we think that's an underserved uh, demographic that can really benefit from the plant. So you mentioned tinctures, bombs, and other uses. 
Do you use the same plant for all these different applications? Uh, yes, in a broad sense, right? So I think it's probably good to put it in context. We also have a hemp uh, grow that we do in partnership with Cadiz, and it's a, and interesting. I'll start there uh, because, you know, hemp and marijuana, let's call them, we use those terms for now, right? One's a St. Bernard and one's a Great Dane, but they're both dogs. And so even at that level, when you think about the 2018 Farm Bill and the fact that it legalized hemp, which is anything, it's cannabis, It's just cannabis with less than 0.3% Delta 9 THC. That's the definition. Everything, though, is cannabis. And you do, you know, the same things just with different genetics. So um, for tinctures, balms, and flowers, you can do all of that with cannabis. Some There's quite a bit of genetic uh, variation, which is actually one of the fun parts of cannabis. Um, You know, there's lots of different strains which have different smells, different colors, different tastes, and really interestingly, different effects as well. So if you know if you compare that to wine, like drinking a cab and drinking a Pinot, they taste different, but you know, the buzz or the, you know, from each of them is the same. And cannabis, it can be a very different uh, you know, mental, psychological, psychoactive effect in there. So a lot of times what happens is if you grow a plant and you take the top part and the buds for flower, you're left with this trim and the trim has quite a uh, you know, ample supply of cannabinoids on it. So if you then take that trim and you extract it, basically wash those cannabinoids off, you get a a concentrate and that concentrate then can be used to make tinctures or vape pens or put into edibles and you still get all the effects um, of the cannabis plant which uh which can vary from strain to strain but again it's, it's really the same plant is the short answer so you mentioned the differences regarding the effects can you perhaps break down some of the vocabulary around the different strains sure so um and, and i would say one thing that's it's the fun and the challenge of cannabis is because of the legal uh, issues around it and, you know, the fact that we've, we're finally coming to an end, but we have spent for the last 50 or 60 years uh, a lot of energy and effort in demonizing and stigmatizing the plant, uh, including making it Schedule 1 at the federal level. And the definition of Schedule 1 is no known medical benefit and a high potential for abuse. So I think both of those statements have pretty resoundingly been disproved. Um, we don't necessarily understand all the whys, but I think, you know, clearly we now have a FDA approved drug that was, uh, you know, came from the cannabis plant in the form of Epidiolex. So, you know, the idea that cannabis has no, no medical benefit, I think is, uh, you know, is well established at this point, but it has led to a lack of research so far. And so a lot of the things that we use in the vocabulary are more anecdotal than I as a, you know, science minded technology person would like, but that is the current state of where things are at. So um, things that you will hear Vocabulary wise, um, I think the cannabinoids are, are pretty well defined. THC is the, you know, the star of the show. Uh, CBD is growing as a uh, supporting member of the band um, pretty rapidly here, but there's about a hundred other ones that most people have never heard of. Uh, CBN, which is good with help with sleep, CBC, CBG, GBA, THCV. There's lots of them in there, right? And um, in all these things, the way I like to think about it, is we have an endocannabinoid system in our body, right? So like we have a circulatory or a nervous system, we have an endocannabinoid system. Our body makes endogenous cannabinoids. You know, serotonin is an example, right? So basically our body is making these, these molecules that have impacts uh, on the receptors in our body. Cannabis is special because it makes phytocannabinoids, right? So it is one of the few plants that makes, it has a bunch of keys for these locks in our body. We don't necessarily understand how all of them work, but we know that they're there and we are starting to embark on a path on figuring them out. So um, when people talk about uh, the plant, a lot of times they talk about the cannabinoids in it and that's why THC gets you stoned um, or that, you know, psychoactive feeling. Uh, CBD doesn't really have much psychoactive effect. Uh, THCA, which is an acid form, has a lot of the anti-inflammatory benefits, but doesn't get you stoned because it's too big to pass through the blood brain barrier and the acid form. So there's lots of cool stuff in there. Um, more, um, more anecdotally, you hear about sativas and indicas. I think probably a more correct terminology is narrow leaf and broad leaf plants, but the idea generally and how it gets used is sativa is to indicate a plant that has more of a kind of energetic effect, you know, something you might want to consume before you went hiking or surfing, whereas indica has a more sedative effect. So maybe you'd want to, you know, use that before a, a movie or before bed. Um, I think the other thing you see is that uh, for the, you know, there's people in our population to self-medicate and sometimes they self-medicate with drugs that are very harmful, like prescription drugs 
uh, opiates and heroines and fentanyls and stuff. And the uh, indica type plants actually tend to have, uh, in some some sense, a kind of similar effect. And I think that's why when cannabis is legalized, you often see a big, you know, double digit percent growth or double digit percent drop in uh, opiate related deaths is because I think that people who need that medic self medication are doing it with cannabis instead of with opiates, and as a result, are not dying because of it. Very interesting. Which one is the broad and which is the narrow? So indica is the broad leaf uh, typically, and uh, and sativa is the narrow leaf. And I'm sure you know we could. There's a lot of uh, you could talk for hours on all these topics. Um, it really it comes from the the climates that the various the strains evolved in, and whether or not they were high up a mountain where it was dry and they were trying to limit uh, their transpiration and deal had plenty of bright sun, or maybe they came from a lower thing like an indica where. Uh, they have plenty of humidity, so they're not worried about broader leaves and transpiring and the moisture loss, but maybe you're more in more competition for the light. So they have big, fat, broader leaves uh, to make up for the, uh, you know, the photosynthesis uh, of, of the shade and stuff. So it really comes from where the plants were uh, originally evolved um, in their climate around them. Got it. So can you speak to yours and Glasshouse Farms approach to what I'm going to call broadly the triple bottom line and yeah. your, you know, your focus on sustainability and the environment. Yes. So triple bottom line is a term that we uh, use and, uh, and live by as well. Um, the way that we define that is uh, we like to do things that are good for the planet, good for the business and good for the consumer. Um, and a, uh, an example of that might be um, that we collect any of the irrigation water that the plants don't use and we capture it, we sterilize it and then we reuse it. So typically when you, when you cultivate, you have a 10 to 15% of overdrain, the water you irrigate with the plants and comes out the bottom rather than letting that flow into the ground and be wasted or maybe even worse, uh, you know, pollute the groundwater table with nitrogen, which, you know, fertilizer water, we capture it, we, we sterilize it, we put it back on the plants, you know, 85% new, 15% uh, reused. And we like that because hey, it's good for the planet. We're not wasting water or polluting things. It's good for the business because water and fertilizer are resources that are cost money. And so by not wasting them, we can uh, bring key prices lower and we can have margins be better. And hopefully, you know, it's good for the consumer because when they have a choice between someone who they know does operate and think like that and someone who doesn't, then hopefully, you know, we hope they pick the one who does uh, try and take that lighter footprint on the planet than, uh, than others might. And your focus on the environment? Yeah. So, you know, I think fundamentally nothing in cannabis, and I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking about the entire industry here, happens without the plant. And the plant comes from planet Earth and Mother Nature. And so for us to do what we do without paying respect and care to the environment seems about as incongruent as one can imagine, right? I mean, we, we are literally given this, uh, this gift, this plant, our business, our livelihoods, uh, the relief and, you know, the customers we have all come from, from the planet and it being healthy to grow this plant. And so everything that we do, uh, we try and do as an eco-friendly and as light a touch as, a, as possible. Um, you know, and uh, there's lots of good examples out of that. I really am a fan of the precision agriculture approach and, uh, and at its core that, that one of the benefits of that, and I think cannabis can be a leader there is that it advocates the idea that you don't, you give the plant exactly what it needs, no more, no less, and you don't waste anything. Um, and, uh, and that I think is a, a real positive impact on, you know, the production, what we make as efficiently as possible relative to the impact it has on the environment. And while I was doing research on your company, I came across an interview where you mentioned the word or the words pesticide drift. Can you share with the audience what that is and what they should look out for? Sure. Yeah. So, um, Cannabis, a lot is, you know, cannabis is probably the most highly regulated crop uh, in the world, I think, um, for sure in the United States. California has some of the tightest regulations uh, anywhere. One of the things that we have to do with every single batch of cannabis we produce before it leaves into the, re into the, into the consumer market, not after, is that we have to test every batch for 66 different pesticides uh, down to a precision of parts per billion. So, um, you know, if you think about organic and you think about all this stuff, organic and all that stuff compared to cannabis is, is like pulled out of the gutter, right? It's all self-reported. There's tons of things you can use. There's no actual empirical testing. Cannabis, on the other hand, is say all you want, but a lab has to pass the product into the retail supply chain by saying it does not contain 
any of these pesticides in it. So what happens and why, why drift becomes a topic is it applies to everybody who uses pesticides. The rule is that when you apply your pesticide, they're only supposed to go where you apply them, right? And that makes a lot of sense, especially when you realize that you have, you know, things like avamectin and things like that, which are literally nerve toxins, and that's how they kill the bugs, that you don't, you know, that shouldn't be drifting onto uh, a house or a school or a playground or whatever. Um, the thing is, is that no one goes around testing that. And so uh, a lot of agriculture does, you know, what they do, and no one actually, there's no canary in the cold mine. Uh, cannabis, on the other hand, not because we asked for it, but because the state appointed us, has to check these things on the products. So we become that drift canary in the coal mine. What drift means is, say you're having a field of avocados and you're applying pesticide from a helicopter and you fly over that field and you spray the pesticide. If that pesticide goes off of the, the avocado orchard, that's drift, right? So technically it is criminal trespass, right? Someone else's stuff is on your stuff where it's not supposed to be. Um, no one typically knows that until cannabis shows up. And then we don't use any of the pesticides because we can't. If all of a sudden those pesticides show up on the test, it can mean that a batch is not sellable, right? I mean, you could have a, a large, uh, you know, high value batch of product that is unable to be sold because someone else applied a pesticide and that pesticide drifted onto the cannabis pro crop and then made it ineligible for sale. So um, we've done quite a bit of work to work with other agriculture. You know, we support all farmers. Uh, we're looking to help them. Uh, but we do... Uh, work with them to communicate so that we can keep that drift from happening so that our plants don't get tainted and also so the you know planet's healthier and safer and we're not putting pesticides where they uh, where they shouldn't be. I think it's a great idea. Cannabis is the canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Graham, I'm going to switch gears here, get to the crux of our conversation, which is the why behind what you do. You mentioned your tech background. You mentioned software.com. You mentioned Sonos, sailing. Why cannabis? Why now? What motivates you? What keeps you going? Yeah, sure. Good question. Um, so I'm, I am a tech guy by training. I'm a tech guy that uh, that loves cannabis and has loved cannabis for a long time. I mean, you know, just you know, the, all the way to my personal life, I find it relaxing and enjoyable and healthier alternative to uh, to alcohol. And I, you know, I kind of believe in that that you know the endocannabinoid system that we talked about is a system. Uh, designed for homeostasis or balance. And so keeping that system balanced, almost like a cannabinoid multivitamin, uh, keeps, helps me be a happier person. Um, but I'm, I'm a tech guy, you know, from a, from a personality, a background, uh, I was one of the original folks at software.com, which was a, a geeky uh, company that made uh, digital post offices, basically. So as people got email addresses, we were the system that stored their email um, and at you know, one point we were doing, I think, 86% of the email on the planet, took it public in 99, great timing, uh, enabled that first sailing trip, trip that we talked about, then came back um, and went on to uh, be one of the early folks at Sonos, a really cool wireless home audio product, um, then started a company making apps for kids uh, that we sold. But all the while, you know, loving cannabis and believing that what we are seeing happen uh, would happen, right? So Mar Martin Luther King Jr. has a great quote, which is, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I've always believed that, you know, the way that we demonize plants are not, should not be illegal. You know, that, that is not the default state of nature. Um, if you think about cannabis um, and uh, its 6,000 year history of being used by people, it's been illegal for 1% of that time. That is not uh, the natural state of things. So I believe that we would come to where we are, which is now currently every state except for three has uh, some form of legal cannabis access, um, that cannabis would become a thing. I got really lucky um, and uh, the fact that it became a thing in my own backyard. Um, and uh, and so what I wanted to do was help destigmatize cannabis, build a business that helped make people feel better, made our communities better, generated jobs and tax revenue and and do it in a way that leveraged um, my technology background which is something that you don't see a lot of in cannabis so you know our, our at glass house our kind of three legs of our stool are quality consistency and efficiency so first you got to do it well then you got to do it well every time and then you got to do it well every time efficiently and computers and technology are really good at that consistency and efficiency piece. And the people on our team are really good at the quality piece. So by putting those together, we believe we could build one of the best ca cannabis companies in the world. So you've been doing it for, like you said, half a decade now. What are some of the most valuable lessons that you've learned on your journey? 
Um, that's a good one. Um, the stigma in cannabis is real. Um, and it's not just a matter of people not being educated. Some people uh, don't want to be educated is, is kind of is something that surprised me. I thought that, uh, you know, people are told things and I, I would call, I would call propaganda the, of the can anti-cannabis prohibition. Um, and I kind of always assumed that when you showed people the facts, right, you showed them that opiate death went down and you showed them that Medicare schedule D, which is prescription drugs, spending went down when you showed them that car accidents didn't go up uh, when we legalized cannabis, that that was, oh, there's, oh okay, oh, I get it. Sorry. I, I thought that these things, you know, I didn't think that I thought it was a gateway drug, not an off ramp drug. And now that you've showed me the data, I, I understand that that happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen all the time. And so you have to you know really kind of keep going on that education uh, train and, and that creates a lot of friction. Um, so I wish I'd known or had, you know, anticipated that better. Um, the other thing is agriculture uh, is really uh, challenging. And so I think uh, everybody should thank their farmer and whatever crop or product, uh, you know, plant that they're growing because plants are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They'll die on Christmas just as much as a Monday afternoon. Uh, there's no scheduling them. Uh, and it really is a, you know, 365 day a year job. So uh, that that's a challenge. But it's also the opportunity. If it was easy, there'd be lots of people doing it and uh, uh, doing cannabis and having uh, figured it out at some scale is, uh, is our competitive advantage now. So speaking of competitive advantage, can you speak to your um, CPG? Sure. Yeah. So uh, CPG, just for, you know, for folks out there, it typically stands for consumer packaged good. Uh, we are we are renaming it as a cannabis packaged good. And uh, one of the things that we've been working really hard on is moving our cultivation, which we started by doing basically wholesale. So we would grow and we would package things up in a pound. And in the old days, we'd sell it directly to a dispensary and they'd break it down into you know eights and individual packages. Now with Prop 64 in California, it works, you know, it, it, you cultivate and then you package and then it goes to distribution and it goes to retail. So we've really been building the Glasshouse Farms brand, the Field brand, Forbidden Flowers and Mama Sue, which are our four consumer brands um, and working to take everything that we've learned, how, you know, done a pretty good job learning how to do that quality, consistency and efficiency and now package them into products that consumers, you know, pick up the shelf. Right. So it's not just cannabis, but it's Glasshouse Farms cannabis. Um, and I think we're, you know, in the midst of a transition uh, in, in cannabis, which is, you know, it's still early days, right? It, it used to, you know, there was not a ton of brand loyalty yet, but that's changing. And we're pushing and, and following that trend because we think the way that we do what we do is quality product, at an amazing price with a really, you know, good community environmental perspective. And I think that's going to resonate well with the consumers that are just starting to walk in the door. And we want to make sure we take uh, advantage of giving them what they need. So speaking of branding, Glasshouse Farms, what does the future hold? It's magic one time, it's 2030. What does Glasshouse Farms look like to you? Yeah, I, so I, I love your question there. So I think it's worth uh, remembering that, you know, in the context of like prohibition, we have not, you know, this isn't even 1931 yet, right? On the federal level, uh, cannabis is still as illegal as any anything can be, uh, which is, is mind-blowing, especially as 47 out of 50 states have decided that that doesn't make sense, but that's still the state of the federal government. So I think, you know, some of the next steps that we're going to see in a broad uh, perspective are uh, a little bit more normalization on the federal level. Um, I think that will open up banking and financial services, which will allow the industry to grow. I think we're going to continue to see a drastic normalization at a society level where we're going to get to cannabis and cannabis products uh, being treated, you know, at best on par or, you know, at least on par with alcohol. And if we're realistic about it, we should probably treat them, you know, with, with more respect than alcohol. Not a lot of people prescribing shots of tequila for medicine, but plenty of people prescribing uh, various cannabis products uh, as medicine right now. Um, and I think Glasshouse Farms can be the, the Casamigos of cannabis, so to speak, right? And the reason uh, I like that example is because I'm a tequila fan. Casamigos is kind of always a good answer, right? You can have a shot, you can put it in a margarita, you can drink it on a Tuesday night, or you can drink it on a Friday night. And it's, it's a good everyday luxury, affordable, and kind of always fits, right? So my favorite tequila might be 1942, but I'd never put that in a margarita or you, when you drink it, you sip it and you, you know, it's an anniversary or a graduation or some special event and you pay, you know, reverence to it as you consume it, which isn't the everyday thing. Uh, on the other hand, maybe, you know, Jose Cuervo's cheap and has caramel in it. And, you know, it's a, 
the college drink and most, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to drink sh- sugary tequila. Um, so the Casamigos is right in the middle. And I think that's what we can make glass house farms. And I would love it if we had interstate commerce and uh, what we were growing here in Santa Barbara was being shipped all around the United States. And we had uh, millions of glass house farms, uh, customers and fans. If you were to guess regarding interstate commerce, when do you see that changing, if ever? Yeah, I, I think um, so. It is interesting to uh, when people think of legalization, I think they kind of connect those things. And it's worth noting that there's various forms of legalization. We could see something uh, like the Safe Banking Act, which really just solves you know banking access, or we could see something like the Moore Act, of which Kamala Harris, uh, you know, the soon-to-be vice president, was a lead sponsor of, and really does. Uh, decriminalize um, and potentially even deschedule cannabis. Um, and then the next step past that is you start to talk about interstate commerce and they're not def- they're not connected, right? So where I could see a more act in the end of 21, maybe 22 kind of timeline, interstate commerce, I think I would be surprised if we really see uh, significant amounts of interstate commerce sooner than three years. I certainly wouldn't be surprised if it was five years because it requires not just the federal government, but it also covers states to be open to it. And I mean, even in alcohol, you typically don't see interstate commerce with alcohol even today. And, you know, this is that's 70 years after prohibition. So there's still dry counties, right? So um, if you think about it in that context, federal legalization does not mean snap your fingers, cannabis is legal everywhere, we're shipping everything around. So I think we're probably a good three to five years away from interstate commerce. I appreciate you shedding light on that. So Graham, last question. If you could share some advice, and it could be professional or personal, or words of wisdom with the audience, what would it be? Uh, let's see, I, I like quotes, so I'll use some uh, some quotes in there. I think you know, one of the quotes I like is, uh, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Um, so I think uh, keeping in mind that a lot of what we're able to do is determined by our mindset. Um, Steve Jobs, another quote, uh, had a good one, and I'll paraphrase, which is, you know, he reminded us that the, the world and the universe was invented by people no smarter than us. So there is not a, you know, they make the rules and we follow them. Uh, we can do things as individuals and as companies that get out there and they make a dent in the world. Um, and there's nobody who's, you know, inherently better or in charge, right? So if you think about those things together, right, that you, the, you can you make the rules as much as anybody else does. And whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Think about what you want to do. Have that positive intention. Believe that you can go out there uh, and do it and make it happen. Um, and then combine that, I'll throw one more Steve Jobs quote in there, which is a, a thousand no's for every yes. Um, you can, you know, as we as individuals can do anything, but we can't do everything. So focus, I think, is is really key. Find what you want to do. Find something that you love. Find something that you think makes the world a better place. Believe in the fact that you can do it with uh, intention and hard work. And then realize that there's nothing that stops you from doing it. So go out and make it happen. Graham, thank you so much. I think that's a great place to end. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Before we go, is there anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, thank you very much for having us, Raj. Awesome. And, and again, uh, I love the podcast and uh, feel, uh, feel honored to have a chance to participate. Thank you, Graham. I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Have a good one. Thank you. Before we go, I'm excited to share that we've launched our comic strip, The Adventures of Mira and Nexi. You can find the first issue at our website, nexuspmg.com, under the Original Content tab. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And you can show your support by sharing our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. If there's a subject or topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email, btu at nexuspmg.com or contact me via our website, nexuspmg.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share what we're reading and thinking about in the clean tech, green tech sectors. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production.